two cameras shoot. One camera has already been recording the struggles of production. But here we are at a new start in life. I am happy to say I have with us today one of the leaders of the 9-11 truth movement with an emphasis on truth that his um, choice in paths of life was to go into science and philosophy. And as between science and philosophy, do you have a favorite? <laughs> well, the philosophy of science combines them both, Joe, so I see, I see. get the best of both worlds. Now, um, there was a, an event in Long Island last month, um, in March 10th, at Stony Brook, where they were holding forth on the question, can the philosophy of science make bridges so that scientists will actually care what they have to say on the subject? And uh, they had an offering of papers. And they also said, and vice versa, could, um, could the physical sciences do anything that would change philosophy? And I submitted uh, my paper that um, indeed science could uh, inform philosophy in the form of uh, Joe Friendly's solar powered compass for negotiating the human domain. But by prior agreement, we won't get into that now. What we're going to talk about is 9 11 as. Well, I will comment on that, Joe. Oh, yeah? To this extent, that the history of science enables us to establish that the aim, goal, or objective of science is the discovery of laws of nature, the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth. But that what philosophy can contribute is clarification about the methods, the means, the procedures, the principles that will enable that goal to be accomplished, if indeed it can be accomplished at all. So that philosophers of science are providing a, a normative analysis of how the discovery of laws of nature may be possible given an adequate conception of the nature of laws and of the principles that define scientific procedure. You know, it's kind of funny that um, along with studying science, I studied law. And uh, in particular, <coughs> toward the end of my legal obligations of studying, I chose comparative law to get a better sense of the phenomenon of laws. And my other scientific side was engineering. Um, yeah, my listening audience doesn't know often I don't throw it out. I originally studied electrical engineering at Caltech. And I chose electrical because I had already fallen in love with amateur radio. And I was a little annoyed that the training they were looking forward to the way electronics was coming up. And so they didn't bother with the, the details of what circuitry. I still didn't know how a television worked when I graduated college. <laughs> and I was annoyed by that. But um, I am a creature of law and science in some sense. That when I went to law school, I was um, <clears throat> a um, avowed anarchist. And uh, the professors played along. It was an intellectual kind of play at the University of Chicago. And um, I was like the resident anarchist. You're still rolling, huh, buddy? Okay. But uh, yeah, no, it's just two hours. Eventually we'll get going. But well, 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 why don't I cut in here and pick up on so then you can switch to me and then you can pick up where you want? Um, I'm, I'm glad ahead. that you mentioned that you were interested in law, Joe, because there's an important difference between laws of society, like laws against murder, kidnapping, robbery, and rape and laws of nature, such as, for example, that uh, gold melts at, at 1,049 degrees Celsius, or that the half-life of polonium-218 is 3.05 minutes. Laws of society can be violated and can be changed and therefore require enforcement. But laws of nature cannot be violated, cannot be changed, and therefore require no enforcement. Well, let me jump right to that. <clears throat> what I thought we would talk most of the time with today when it comes to 9-11 and the argument that we make now that the 
evidence is already in. We don't need, in fact, investigation to determine what happened. We know for a fact that the steel in the middle of the, the core steel beams of the two towers were so massive, so substantial, so much steel arranged together in a pretty nice uh, grouping of strength that we know we have a certain respect for steel. I mean, I, I studied steel in, in college and at Caltech from the point of view that they figured that was an important thing we're supposed to know about. The steel is, first of all, among the most elastic substances we have. <coughs> and that was a surprise. I thought it was rubber. And, they, and when you define elasticity as returning to where it was before the stress, steel plays that game better than rubber. So we have steel that burns it, uh, melts at 2800, that gets soft. Ah, when does it start losing its strength? That's what the, that's where the big fight is right now. Where, or there isn't much of a fight, but the big joke, if I can just jump to jokes, is that in the popular mechanics book that tries to debunk our movement, when they try to deal with the, the temperature question, that kerosene burns at 1200, 1500 in a jet engine with lots of pressure and all that, whatever, some numbers like that. But uh, popular mechanics couldn't handle that. They had to say 2100 degrees. So for popular mechanics to say kerosene burns at 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, <coughs> the only basis for that choice, I think, was that they thought if they got caught, they'd have an excuse that it was a typographical error. It was supposed to be a 12 instead of a 21. But the, the idea is that what could make those steel beams disappear, more or less, and, and just in, end up in, in those 30-foot-long, uh, bite-sized pieces that Controlled Demolition Incorporated is their concern for cutting steel that it's in truckable length. But what could, what could make it happen? And... Um, well, according to the government, of course, the official account was that the jet plane served as jet fuel delivery systems, and yet most of that fuel burned up in those spectacular fireballs in the first 10 or 15 seconds, which means that there was a relatively modest amount of jet fuel left to burn. Now, that fuel was distributed a bit irregularly and didn't burn hot enough or long enough to cause the steel to even weaken, much less melt. In fact, even the National Institute for Standards and Technology, Joe, studied 236 samples, which it had selected, and discovered that none of that steel, or only three out of the 236, had been exposed to temperatures above 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which was the estimate in general of how hot those temperatures had burned. And yet, according to the underwriter's laboratory, the steel had been certified to 2,000 degrees for three to four hours. So not only did the steel, was the steel exposed to temperatures far too low to cause it to even weaken, much less melt, but far too briefly because in the South Tower, the fire only endured for less than an hour, in the North about an hour and a half. So it's ridiculous to suggest that it was the fires that weakened the steel that led to the collapse. All right, good. I think uh, that helped. Let me go to the next point, which I think is the big one, and that is, if you look at 9-11 Mysteries by Sophie, that video interviews controlled demolition experts. Mm -hmm. They show you how they tape the cutting charges matter-of-factly on a 45-degree angle on the vertical steel column beams. And they explain why the 45 degrees and so forth. But assuming that one would simply take all the, the 47 core beams of the center of the towers and just attach those cutting charges every three stories or so, up and down, all the way, that could do the job. The only thing is, the question I think, and that's my question to you, is that access possible? If indeed you could stand on top of an elevator and just work your way through, is that where those beams are? Are they? Does, do the elevator shafts have access to those beams? Well, that's an interesting question, Joe. We've just gained access to the blueprints, and I suppose the elevator shafts would give you access to a lot, but there's a physical problem with that scenario in the first place, which means that you're going to have a whole lot of floors, 
that aren't being blown up or cut, which means you're going to wind up with a stack of pancakes now. Uh, Judy Wood, who has degrees in uh, civil engineering with an emphasis in structural engineering, in engineering mechanics, which is applied physics, and in materials engineering science, which is probably the discipline most relevant to these issues. That's the area in which she has her PhD. Has estimated that the stack of material left from, from uh, a collapse of the kind you're describing, even brought down by controlled demolition, would be about 10 to 12 percent of the building, which would mean if we're talking about a 110 story building, it should be in excess of 12 floors high that you'd have a stack. And yet, when all was said and done, these buildings were brought down to ground level, essentially. In fact, there are photographs which you can tell were on the day of 9 11 because Building 7 is still standing and the debris field is approximately at ground level. Now, that would be impossible if only these kinds of cutter charges were involved. Plus, of course, as you're implying, there are not only 47 core columns on every floor, but 240 external perimeter columns, which means it would have been a massive job to install those cutter charges. Not only that, but the only pattern we have is for cutter charges of this kind that can cut through two inches of steel. And in, at the core, the bottom most portions were four inches thick, which would imply you'd have to put cutter charges both inside and outside the beams, which appears to provide insuperable obstacles to no. doing a thorough job using cutter charges. Now, hold on. I just want to zoom in on that fact for a little while, and then we'll let you come back to it, because you're, I think you're making good points. When it comes to how thick a steel the cutter charges can deal with, in the popular mechanics, argument, they quote, of all people, Luzo himself from Controlled Demolition Incorporated, the president of the company that we believe, I believe, did the job, the company that was hired to do the cleanup. And he says, cutting charges don't work more than three inches. You said 2.5, but here's the joke, Jim, if you didn't catch this uh, popular mechanics great moments in their typical <laughs> cynicism. So they say, they quote, and they say, the president says cutting charges won't work with steel thicker than three, and the beams, the core beams and at the World Trade Center towers were 14 inches on edge. 14 inches on edge. But you're talking about thickness, of course, right. not so their... They changed the subject. They said he won't work with steel <laughs> thicker than three, and these were 14 inches on edge. That's a very strange remark to make, but of course that the Popular Mechanics uh, article and the book that followed is unsourced, unreferenced, makes lots of gratuitous claims, for example, in relation to Building 7. It merely states baldly, without any justification at all, to explain why that building came down in what appears to have been a classic controlled demolition, that the fires burned much hotter than were supposed. <laughs> That's it. Oh. So we got fire being blamed. We have um, to go. Oh, well, let me get back to what you were saying as far as what happened to everything. That's the thing that the, if you calculate the volume, and uh, the, uh, there is one obvious answer that I don't think most people would quarrel with. It was converted into a powder, a fine dust. <laughs> That's exactly right, and this is why it's uh, actually a misdescription to suggest that the buildings collapsed. What happened is they were pulverized, or in Morgan Reynolds' memorable phrase, blown to kingdom come. In fact, the massive process of dustification was so enormous that eventually virtually all of lower Manhattan was enveloped in, in millions of cubic yards of dust. It's an astonishing phenomenon. And if you watch and rewatch those buildings come down, it's so patently obvious that not only is the government's account hopelessly inadequate, but that any appeal to merely conventional explosives such as RDX or HDX or thermite or thermate cannot possibly begin to explain not only what happened to the Twin Towers themselves, but the peculiar kinds of damage that were inflicted on the other buildings in the World Trade Center, three, four, five, and six. Now, let's, that's where we're going to devote our energy for the rest of the show. That that's, I think you've drawn the, the mark where the, the question is that my own sense up until this very moment, Jim, has been that conventional explosives, if you had enough of them, could do it. 
that the concrete floors were foamy four inch thick stuff. So that was not a real problem. So what we're really talking about is the office furniture and the people and you know whatever else was in there. How much explosive power would it take to do the dust trick? And when it comes to the dust trick, I want to say also while we're on the subject, for anybody here who has a, is a doubter, I mean, the, the first place to look, if you haven't seen the light yet, is, is the cloud patterns of the explosions of the buildings. That the cloud patterns look, you know, just the texture of, the, of those clouds, they're going up, and they, they are what explosions do, what volcanic uh, eruptions do. There is a certain texture to that kind of clouds that's saying, Explosions are going on here. Very thick, very hot. Beams are being blown outward and upward, some hundreds of feet into buildings across the street. A massive amount of energy that is unavailable on the government's account or on any merely conventional explosive account is required to bring about these effects. Now, that, here's where I'm stumping it. I'm saying conventional explosives could pop steel beams up. I mean, that's what explosions do, is you pop them up, you know, just... Um, now, I don't know how much explosive power, I would say like a 200 pound bomb, when that hits something, the 200 pounds worth of dynamite in other words, what is your sense of how powerful 200 pounds when it goes off? Can it? Well, without any doubt, if we'd exposed a, exploded a nuke down there, you could have got this kind of damage to the, to the Twin Towers. It could have decimated them, just as at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the damage was so massive, which is one reason why many nukes have been introduced into the discussion as a possible mode of demolition here. We'll get there maybe. Oh, okay, I, you know, I'm wondering, I have to confess, I've been like postponing getting here. <laughs> I hear the possibility, but before we get to the nukes, let's, let's try a little harder to give poor little conventional explosives a chance. Maybe, you know, if they put a bunch of them in, they could what do you think? What do you, can we can make a case for a convention? Well, I think it would have to be quite a lot. Now, Steve Jones has speculated, I think, about 3,000 pounds, he suggested, of uh, RDX in conjunction say, say with thermite 30, or thermate. 30,000 pounds? What do you think? 300,000? No, well, I don't know. This is, a, this is huge. I mean, I'm not an expert on demolitions myself. Yeah. But the massive kind of damage that was in, in the rate at which this was done and the failure to find evidence that supports for example the use of rdx which happens to be chemically tagged oh so it's chemically tagged yeah so if you find residue of rdx it would enable you to determine the source of manufacture suggests to me that what's going on here is is not going to be uh, is something that falls into the conventional category when it comes to the mode well, of when it comes to conventional category it wasn't supposed to have to be conventional because you got, um, I mean, I assume it's Controlled Demolition Incorporated and the U.S. government have a, a working group that's figuring out what to do. So since the U.S. government is involved when it comes to whether it's tagged or untagged, they could get some untagged stuff, I assume. You know, I wouldn't rule it out. When it comes to conventional and non-conventional or some hot new stuff from the Pentagon, I think that Rumsfeld and Cheney had complete access to anything that the Pentagon can pull off. If they needed like uh, some some just extra good explosives, then that would do it. But I would say, as far as doing better than C4, maybe they can go C7. You know, I don't know. Well, let me put it this way, Joe: If conventional explosives were used, it hasn't been shown how it could have been done and the effects that would have been brought about. The research by Stephen Jones into thermite and thermate has purely been devoted to establishing evidence, which is itself controversial or capable of being disputed, that there was sulfur residue in some of the steel and that there was some evidence of thermite. Sulfur together with thermite would be thermate, this more powerful or rapid working form of a cutter charge. But remember, under that analysis, you're still relying upon gravity to bring the buildings down. And the rate at which all of this is going on is so fast. We're talking about 210-story buildings being demolished completely in 10 seconds apiece. And you want to recall, too, that uh, 
John Skilling, who was a senior partner in the engineering firm that designed the, billion, uh, the buildings, observed before their construction that they were designed to support 2,000% more than their expected live load. That's 20 times more than they would ever be expected to carry in terms of uh, human occupancy, office furniture, and, and the bit, which is another reason for questioning why any argument about the weakening of the steel is suspect. Suppose the steel lost half of its carrying capacity. It was overbuilt to the tune of 20, 20 times, so that would bring it down to 10 times. It could still sustain 10 times. One of the great failures of the NIST is to show that the, the force that would be exerted by mass that was supposed to be falling on the remnant of the building could not absorb that mass and sustain it. And here you not only encounter the principle of the conservation of momentum, namely you're going to require some mass to move this mass that's below the falling mass, but a point nicely made in a recent submission requesting that NIST revise its work under the Data Quality Act because its arguments are so patently inadequate is that all of that building above that's turning to dust cannot be a part of any mass that is falling and creating an additional weight for the lower portions to carry. And remember, all those lower portions were designed to carry everything above them. What this means, Joe, is the NIST's position is completely incoherent. And indeed, the only way it can make a, an argument that has a, even the veneer of plausibility is by begging the question. So Our, you're basing your, what you're just saying is that because the, the, the physical contents aren't there, it did get blown away, they don't deal with that at all in their report. They, don't, they treat it as though it we're all falling in a block when it's already been blown away and is no longer a part of the mass that would be exerting weight under the influence of gravitational attraction, which is just one of numerous ways in which we can demonstrate that the NIST's own report, the government's official scientific report on the, the World Trade Center, is incoherent. So at this point, let's imagine that I managed to achieve a roll-in from uh, Rick Siegel's uh, Eyewitness Hoboken, where he says, look here, folks, here I am on uh, the other side of the river, and look at this shot I got of the, the smoke, the smoky side of one of the towers, and it's dark smoke, and it's covering up, you know, like something like 50% of the side of that building. And um, he says, now look closely into this dark smoke. And he zooms in so it's covering like about six floors. And you see through the smoke the explosions that are doing this evaporation, evaporation, whatever you call, not quite evaporation, but severe dismemberment. And um, the what's striking, and I want, I'll eventually we'll edit this in, is when you look at the rate of the explosions, there are like several in a second. And they're going off almost at random in a fairly wide field. In other words, there's like flash here, then one down here, then here, then here, then here. And they're going sort of in this frequency. And they didn't look like explosions to me that an explosion wouldn't just be a single flash of light. I have to say that, that I was puzzled. Why would it be just a flash? It wasn't um, one of these things. Several points to make here. At the initiation of the collapse, you can see when the top of the building first starts to fall, you can see a massive explosion extending the, the breadth of the whole building. You can see the red, it's intense, and it's massive. No collapse. There's no gradual asymmetrical sagging, nothing that would be consistent with the government's official account. This is suggestive that conventional explosives were used to initiate the sequence. Then, for the intermediate, call it 80 percent of the building, you have this weird thing going on that we're struggling to try to explain. Now, we have report after report after report from firemen saying they heard an explosion, they heard another explosion, they heard another explosion. So they were hearing explosions. And the pattern you describe, indeed, is not consistent with any pattern of demolition with which we are familiar. And the question then becomes, what is the source of these explosions that are taking place in this seemingly random but very comprehensive pattern, as though it were intended to blow the building completely to smithereens?
So something is going on here. The, 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 the explosions that they heard, those were popping the beams, this is what I would imagine. But we're, we're talking about exotic weapons for the, the pulverization. There's, there appears to be a lot going on here, mixed causation. Just, just to offer a further observation, Will, William Rodriguez, who is the senior custodian in the North Tower and the last man to leave the building, observed, reported that there was a massive explosion in the sub-basements prior to the impact of the plane on the building. Now, two members of scholars, Craig Furlong and Gordon Ross, have pursued this issue. They got very exact seismological data from Columbia University, which maintains these seismographs, very exact data from radar about when the planes impacted the building. And they determined on the basis of very precise data that William Rodriguez was correct and that these explosions in the sub-basement level occurred as much as 14 to 17 seconds before the planes hit the building. Now, they have been so scrupulous that they've gone back and reassessed their data to try to tweak it any possible way that would make sense, and they still come up with 10 to 11 seconds. These explosions were taking place in the sub-basement before the, the, the planes hit the building, which means, suggests to me the planes were a diversion, a psychop, a distraction, and of course the fireballs were shock and awe to create the psychological impression that this was the cause of what would subsequently occur, when in fact it bore no relationship to it at all. The buildings, of course, were designed to withstand the impact of the then largest commercial airliners, which were Boeing 707s, which found to be very comparable to the 767s that pur are purported to have hit the building. Indeed, because the 707 has a higher cruising speed, if the planes hit the building at their cruising speed, the 707 would make a greater impact on the building than would the 767. Now, Frank Martini, who was a project manager, described the impact of the planes on the building as being analogous to sticking pencils through mosquito netting. He said he was confident the buildings could withstand multiple impacts. No, I didn't think it was. I, I take issue. It wasn't mosquito netting. It was your screen door. Well, yeah, I think he, no, he actually says mosquito netting. Uh oh. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, but that's okay. Right. But, but I mean, the point is he no, says right. multiple impacts because the 47 core columns and the intricate lattice structure of the building, and right. this is one of the most soundly engineered pairs of buildings the world has ever seen. Perhaps the only building more soundly engineered than the Twin Towers was Building 7, which makes it all the more questionable how Building 7 could possibly have come down any other way than by a very thorough form of classic controlled demolition from the bottom up. The big difference we have between Building 7, for example, and the Twin Towers is that the Twin Towers are, are basically exploding from the top down. Judy Wood has offered the memorable metaphor that it's as though you had two gigantic trees that are turning to sawdust from the top down. Notice none of the buildings in the Twin Towers are moving. In relation to Building 7, however, you have a classic controlled demolition at the bottom. You're blowing out one of the main support beams to draw the building slightly in, into itself so it won't fall outward. And all the floors are moving at the same. Let me, let me just interrupt for one hit there, but you're on, all right, I'm digging. Uh, the top part of the one building starts falling over too early. It's like it tips, right? Yes. Okay. Now, was, I don't know. That was the first one to fall or the second? Uh, well, this, oddly enough, yeah. although the North Tower was hit first, and it was hit on the 96th floor, where the steel would have been thinner, the plane hit toward the center, which means it could be expected to do more damage to the cork columns, and the fires burned longer and were more widely distributed on the floor. It fell second which is a gross contradiction for the government's official account, because if it were correct in its theory of causation, the North Tower ought to have fallen before the South. The so South was hit on the 80th floor on an angle where you would not expect much damage to the core columns. Right. And it had a, a bigger fireball, less fire, burned much more briefly, and should have, if the government's theory of causation were correct, fallen second. Right. But instead it fell first. Right. One of the oddities of the NIST claim or analysis is that more core columns were damaged in the South Tower than were damaged in the North. Uh, six in the North, ten in the South, which is quite puzzling since a plane hit at an angle and you wouldn't expect that to occur at all. Now, the fast